that I will go through. Hopefully you can see those. So I am a PhD student at the University of New South Wales in Australia and I study viruses or virology. So I'm going to present to you today about COVID-19, which I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, so I will start at the beginning with what is a virus. So there's a few different types of things that can infect people. Things like bacteria, um, protests are like malaria, you can have head lice, and viruses are a type of pathogen which can infect us and make us sick. Unlike the other types, they are not alive. So they're not, they don't have a cell, we call it not cellular. All that they are is a protein coat or a capsid that surrounds material inside. So if you can see on my camera, this is like a virus. It's a little circular shell full of genetic information. So when a virus infects us, it infects a cell and makes our cell copy itself. So our cells end up making lots and lots of copies of this virus. And viruses infect every domain of life that we know of, even other viruses. And I've got a lovely picture in the bottom right of some viruses which are actually infecting a bacteria. Um, and we are looking at trying to use these as a kind of bacterial therapy. So the take home message is there are viruses everywhere. So what I'm interested in specifically is coronaviruses. This is a family of viruses, so as or a type, and there's four different genuses or genera that make up this family. Alpha coronaviruses is the top. These cause a lot of common colds. So up to 20% of colds that you get where you get a runny nose are just caused by coronaviruses and they're not too bad. The ones that we're worried about are in the beta coronavirus genus. These are the ones that have caused previous pandemics and this is where SARS coronavirus is. There's also gamma coronavirus and delta coronavirus, but these tend to infect birds and wildlife and we don't worry too much about them. And there's a lovely picture on the right here of SARS-CoV-2, or current coronavirus, um, actual particles infecting someone's lungs. So that's what they look like. They're little spherical circles. And you can see the spikes sticking out as these dark orange bits around the edge. So getting into the virology, which is what I study, uh, I want to know what specifically is this virus? What does it look like? What does it make? So it has a genome, which is its genetic information made of RNA. And it's one long strand. So on the right here, you can see this really long strand. That's the genome of the coronavirus. And it's split up into these rectangles. And these are the different genes that it makes. And you can see on the picture on the left, they've color coded the genes to how it actually assembles into a virion. So for example, this little green bit on the end, the N, that is what encapsulates the genetic information in the nucleocapsid. The S in yellow is the spike protein. So that's that yellow bit that sticks out from the surface. Um, and then the off 1A and 1B are what replicates it. So it's actually quite a complicated virus when you get down to it compared to other ones like a polio virus that's a lot simpler than this, which means it's quite tricky to treat. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So for a bit of context, we have had past coronavirus pandemics. Uh, we had SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, in 2002 to 2004, which was first identified in China um, and infected over 8,000 people. Following on from that, we had a MERS pandemic, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, in 2012. And the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome is thought to have come from bats, and then to camels, and then to humans. And SARS-1 is thought to have come straight from bats. And what we're looking at now is SARS coronavirus 2. So it's the same family, same genus, a new type of virus. This was first identified in China in November 2019, and it was characterized by unusual cases of pneumonia. So people were getting sick in their upper respiratory tract, they were coughing, they were having trouble breathing, and people weren't really sure what was causing it for a few months. And then they identified it was this new virus, a coronavirus. In January 2020, the first genome sequence was uploaded, which is huge for people like me. Uh, because once we know the genome, we can start to study it really well and we can look for treatments and vaccinations. This virus is less severe than SARS. Um, it does kill a lot of people, but not as many as SARS. The main thing is it's a lot more transmissible, so it's easier for people to catch. This led to lockdowns and social isolation globally around the world. And we've now got recent vaccinations programs, but overall the pandemic is still going 
And I've got a graph here of New South Wales. So that's in Australia where I live. These are the spikes that we've seen last year. So we had a big outbreak in February till about May. That was stopped when we went into isolation and lockdown. So we had to stay in our homes and we couldn't go outside. And that is what helped with that. We had another small one in July. And we actually have one at the moment right now. So we're in lockdown too. But without many treatments or many preventions, the best thing we can do is wear masks and distance. So how can we improve that? Okay, a bit on the symptoms. You probably know about this already, but it primarily affects the lower respiratory tract. So that's like your lungs, not so much your nose and your mouth. So you don't tend to get a runny nose or anything like a head cold. You tend to get symptoms lower down in the chest. Specifically, if you're interested in the biology, it binds to something called an ACE2 receptor on your cells. And those are cells only found in the lungs, and that's how it gets in. Um, and it can lead to more severe symptoms throughout the body if it spreads, like blood clots, um, myocarditis and pericarditis, which is swelling of your heart, which is quite bad, um, loss of smell and taste, and long COVID. Pretty nasty. All right, how does it infect people? So it's transmitted through direct contact. 80% of transmissions are through this. So this is people shaking hands or coughing on each other or even just talking close to each other can spread it. It can also be spread through indirect surfaces. So if you cough onto a keyboard or you cough onto a book or a table, someone comes afterwards, touches that table and then touches their face, that can also spread it. And that's 20% of transmissions are from that. Um, and also fecal oral route. But the good thing that we know about coronavirus is it's got a viral envelope, which is a protective shell that's actually quite delicate. It's made of fats. And this is prone to desiccation or dehydration. So if we can dry out the virus, we actually inactivate it. So we know that dry, hot environments like deserts, it's not going to last very long outside of the human body. If we put it in the full sunlight, the UV will destroy it. Um, and it also means that alcohol or detergent like hand wash will also destroy it because it's got this delicate envelope. That's quite useful. Okay, so we're looking at where it came from now. It probably originated from bats, who's looking at SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. Bats were where the original coronaviruses came from. And people have actually looked in bats for similar viruses and found a lot of coronaviruses there. So we know that bats carry them, and it's quite probable that the coronavirus did come from a bat to humans. People think that it also might have gone via a pangolin, which is this uh, strange looking mammal that's got armor plates on it. Definitely could have. But the problem is, it's been so long. It's been almost two years now, since 2019. It's going to be hard to figure out where it came from the more time it passes. Um, and you may have heard the lab leak theory that maybe some scientists in China released it on purpose. There's not much evidence on this. I'm not saying it's not true, but there's not too much evidence yet. yet. And I don't know if we'll ever know completely. Um, now that it's been so long. And just to show you a tree, so this is called a phylogenetic tree, and we work with a lot of these in virology. And it shows you the relationship of different viruses together. So anything that's in a cluster, like this top little group, they are all related. And this is the second group, those are all related. I hope you can see my cursor. Oh, my so pointing. The red one is SARS-CoV-2. And if you look at the little sequences, it's hard to read, but the one above it and a few below it, these are bats sequences. So this tells you that the most related viruses are bats. That's a bit of evidence saying that it probably did jump from a bat to a person rather than being genetically engineered. Okay, okay. that's all the heavy stuff on coronavirus. Now I'm going to talk about prevention and treatment. So, as I mentioned before, the way that we're preventing it in Australia, mostly, is just through wearing masks, through staying distance from each, from each other, disinfecting hands, not crowding together, you know, trying to avoid buses and trains and things like that. What we ultimately want to do is have a nice widespread vaccination system. Because vaccination, while it doesn't stop you from catching it, it means that you get less severe symptoms. So, if you were going to catch it and die, if you're vaccinated, you might catch it and just get a cough instead, which is much better. And it means you've got less chance of passing it on to someone else. So that's the way that we're going. So a bit on how a vaccine works. 
If you have never heard of a verb tense or how it works before, um, this is a bit of a crash course, but it teaches your immune system to recognize a pathogen. So the way the immune system works is you get infected with something and your body takes about two weeks to understand what it's infected with. So say it gets a virus like this, two weeks later, it will recognize, okay, I need to look for something blue and I need to look for something spherical and I need to kill it. So that's fine. But if the virus kills you before that two week period, you're in trouble. So a vaccine is a bit of a shortcut. You inject this blue thing in and you say, watch out for this. And it means that as soon as you're infected with it, you don't have to wait two weeks. Your immune system will fight it straight away. And you can usually clear it a lot faster than if you're not vaccinated. So if you let your body identify the virus faster, your body can react faster, your body will clear the infection faster, and you'll get less severe symptoms. So you're probably not going to die if you've been vaccinated. And there's a few different ways that we can make vaccines. So this is a list of few of them. This is covering technology from the last 20 or 30 years. The main way that we used to make them is by actually inactivating the virus. So we grow a lot of virus, uh, like we'll grow a lot of coronavirus, we then kill it or deactivate it, and we'd inject the virus into your body. That was quite expensive, and it didn't that well. So the next thing we tried to do was an attenuated virus. This is like a weak version. So you have a coronavirus, you take it from a human and you put it in a monkey, for example. You grow it in the monkey until it can't infect human cells anymore, so you've weakened it, then you use that as a vaccine. The danger to that, or with that, is that if it mutates back, it can actually infect us. So that's quite a dangerous one, and we don't use attenuated viruses too much anymore because they're still alive. Viral subunit is quite a common one. Uh, so if you remember the spike protein, I'm just going to jump back. What we're going to be talking about is this one, this yellow one. This spike protein is what coronavirus, what our body sees um, when we're infected. So that's what we want to make a vaccine against. So you can just inject that protein and then your body will learn to recognize it. And that's what subunit vaccines do. What we're going to be looking at is viral vector and mRNA. These are two relatively new vaccine technologies which are used in coronavirus vaccines. So the top one viral vector is in the AstraZeneca vaccine. The messenger RNA or mRNA ones are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. So they work in different ways. This lovely little infographic which explains it, so I'll briefly go over this. So you have the virus at the beginning. We want to make this spike protein to teach our body what the spike protein looks like so we can be protected against it. The first and simplest way to do that is protein-based. So spike protein is purified and you just inject that. That results in your body making antibodies. That's what we want. The second, which is what the AstraZeneca does, is you take the gene for the protein. So you're not actually taking the protein, you're taking the instructions for how to make the protein, packaging it inside a virus, and using that to get it into your body. So instead of us putting the protein in, we actually teach our body how to make the protein, which results in antibodies being produced. The third way, which is doing messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines, so this is Pfizer and Moderna, we put in RNA, which encodes for the spike protein, and again, we make our body produce the spike protein. So briefly to go over the benefits, the bottom two are the best. The bottom one is the best, definitely messenger RNA. This is one of the first vaccines that's ever used it. I think we're going to see a lot more mRNA vaccines in the future because it's a great technology. Um, instead of just injecting one or two spike proteins, we teach our body how to make it. So our body can make 100 to 200 spike proteins, which means it's going to make a lot more antibodies at the end of it. So that's prevention, which is great. But if you've already got coronavirus, a vaccine is not going to help you. There is a difference between a prevention and a treatment. So treatment is what we use, um, is something called antivirals. So they're like antibiotics, but they treat viruses instead. There are some experimental drugs that have been trialed. Um, I've got a list of them here. But these were all repurposed. So what that means is they were drugs to treat something else, like influenza. And people basically said, okay, why don't we try it on coronavirus and see if it works? 
they kind of work, work but not really. They're, they're not custom made for coronavirus. They're never going to treat it that well. So what everyone around the world is doing, um, and part of my lab as well, is trying to make an antiviral to treat specifically coronavirus. So the two types of antivirals that you can have are ones that target the immune system. So it doesn't matter what you're sick with, they're going to upregulate the immune system. This means that you're going to feel quite ill because when you get a fever, that's your immune system reacting. If you upregulate that, you're going to get an even worse fever. But it does work. However, there's lots of side effects and it's usually a long treatment plan. So if you have an immune system antiviral in a little pill or something, you often have to take that pill three times a day for about 12 weeks, which is a long time to get rid of a virus. What we ideally want to be looking at developing is an antiviral that targets the virus itself. So this does need to be custom designed per virus, something that works against SARS-1 won't work against SARS-2. Um, it's very expensive to make, unfortunately, but it has limited side effects and a very short treatment plan. You'd be able to take one of these antivirals and probably get rid of the virus in about a week, which is a lot better than 12 weeks. So that's what we're trying to do at the moment. And it's probably going to take a few years, but fingers crossed we'll get the first one out next year. And that will obviously change quite a lot of patient outcomes. Okay, so looking ahead at the next few years, sorry if this was a bit of a crash course or intense, I wasn't sure how much you knew about viruses, so I thought I'd go through everything. Um, but that's a bit of a summary of what we're up to so far. So what can we do now with all that information? We need to be a little bit more preemptive about pandemics. This is the third coronavirus pandemic in 21 years, since the year 2000. We're definitely going to have a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. So, so what can we, we do, do to, to stop these, these or um, catch them in time? time? One thing that a lot of people are focusing on is looking for the virus before it gets to humans. So when it's a pandemic, it's already reached humans and it's spreading. Can we catch it at the point before it has jumped from bats to humans? So what this involves is something called viral discovery, where you take bats, um, you can take either organs from them or fecal samples or swabs and sequence it and look for new viruses. Can we find a new coronavirus and maybe make a treatment before it's even a problem? That would be great. We also want to research into viruses and trends. What makes a good pandemic virus? Can we identify that every single pandemic virus has this thing in common? And then we can go use that trait to look in the future. So, for example, does every pandemic virus always have the same type of spike protein? If so, let's go searching for that spike protein and maybe we can find the viruses before they infect us. And the last thing we can do is we can continually monitor or set up these monitoring systems to try and catch these pathogens. Um, so that's what we're, one of our labs is doing at the moment. We are doing something called wastewater surveillance. So what happened in Australia is we often caught the outbreak quite late because we have to wait for people to go into hospitals and then we have to test them and then we have to figure out it's coronavirus. And by that time, that person has already infected another 10 people. We can cut that out by doing a thing called wastewater surveillance, which has been successfully trialled in Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne, all in Australia, as well as overseas countries like Italy. And it detects the RNA in the middle of the virus, or the genetic material, from the wastewater. Um, so everyone uses wastewater. And this means we can either catch it at a city level and say, okay, these suburbs are infected, or we can even catch it at a building level and say, okay, someone in this building has coronavirus, everyone needs to be careful. The only problem is it can be quite hard to detect. If you have one person that's sick in a whole city, or maybe 10 people in all of Sydney, that's not very much RNA to work with. So you have to have very, very sensitive techniques. Um, so there's a lot of work going into improving this science. Okay, and just to wrap everything up, in the next few years, unfortunately COVID is going to be here to stay. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. We don't have treatments yet, and we've only just got vaccines. So we've got at least another three or four years of this. 
We're going to have a key developing vaccine. As you know, there's different variants. So we started with the alpha and beta variants. This year, we have the delta variant and remote, which the vaccines are not as effective against. So we're going to have to have new vaccines developed each year to counter the variants. But it's probably going to lose the variant and come more like a seasonal flu. So over time, you're going to have less people dying of coronavirus, and it'll be more like, oh, I need to take a month off or two weeks off work because I have COVID, and everyone will say, okay, that's okay. We'll get used to it. Okay, okay. so that's everything I have prepared. To summarise, if you're interested in coronavirus and COVID, it's a very interesting field. It's very relevant. Um, if that's something you think you want to do in the future, there is a lot of opportunity to research it as a scientist. There's antivirals, vaccines, the virology, you could find new viruses in bats, um, you can go look at the evolution of viruses, it's a huge field um, that is great for both people studying biology, chemistry and also computer science. We need a lot of people to analyse it. Um, so if you're interested in more about this, you can reach out to me. Um, you hopefully have more details from this. So I've done a presentation on coronavirus, but I also research on viral fossils in human genomes um, and what they do for us. So viral viruses have been around throughout the evolution and they've helped us along. I want to know what they're doing now. Do they help protect us or not? Or do they help hurt us? Um, I'm involved in discovering new viruses and in antiviral development. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, I've got some social media, you can send questions through, um, yeah, that's everything that I had. Okay. So if you have any questions now, I'm happy to take some. Okay, thank you Emma for your presentation, it was really informative and if anyone, any school, participating in school has any question, please ask. Participating in schools, if you have any question, you may ask right now. Any question? Hello, Emma. Thank you so much. It's a nice presentation. I just want to know that this uh, uh, COVID-19, which is uh, hurting almost all the sectors of the world, what more to be done in order to protect our students? Because uh, the most affected uh, uh, community is the student community, especially the disturbance in the education. So can you advise anything that we can just do for the emotional composition of the students? Um, it broke up a little bit. I just want to check that I got your question right. Um, so you're asking what schools can do for students to come if they come back in to help prevent yes. the coronavirus or COVID-19. Is that yes. correct? Yes, true. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's interesting. Every um, different country seems to have a different approach to this. So the best thing would be vaccination but that's not available to everyone like even in Australia we don't have enough at the moment so what you want to try and be doing is remember how it's spread which is through mouth um, so coughing talking laughing singing um, if there's anything you can do to minimize that so mask is the best um, that will catch a lot of the viral particles um, and remembering that the virus envelope is quite easy to destroy um, so, so it can be destroyed by sunlight, by heat, and by disinfectant. So if you want to stop it spread, the two main things are watch your mouth, cover it in some way with a mask or something, and wipe down surfaces and wash your hands. That's the most effective way to stop it um, in confined spaces. And sometimes that's the best you can do. Okay, thank you so much. No problem.
Okay, Emma, thank you uh, so much for your time. And uh, in future, we would have uh, different other sessions with you. Thank you for your time. And see you thank later. You. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a really informative and effective presentation. Technology, like art, is a soaring exercise of human imagination. With these words of Daniel Bell, the second guest school of today's event, Hayat School and College Hyderabad, is requested to proceed 